I would say beauty means that we're responding in a certain kind of way. So the perspective I've gained is not so much that beauty is in things, although of course things that we think are beautiful have certain kinds of properties. Symmetry is one, but uniqueness can be another. Complete lack of symmetry, asymmetry can be another. Colour, form, those are all aspects of what we call beauty. But what's really interesting is not the properties of the things we find beautiful, but the response we have to the things we find beautiful. And that's what beauty means to me. It means we're responding in a certain kind of way. And the way we respond is by feeling glad that this thing exists that we are experiencing. We feel happy. <laughs> There's a sense of, of rejoicing, actually, that it exists. And it quickly becomes something where you start to want to use quite relational language, language which ends up talking about love, really, of what we study. Structural biology is framed about a set, around a set of techniques, the best established of which is X-ray crystallography, which first came to prominence in the middle of the 20th century through the solution of structures of proteins such as myoglobin, which stores oxygen in muscles, hemoglobin, obviously carrying oxygen around the blood, the structure of insulin solved by Dorothy Hodgkin and colleagues, and so on. Since then, X-ray crystallography has solved many tens of thousands of structures. Um, and there are now hundreds of thousands of structures available for different proteins. It also involves a technique called cryoelectron microscopy, which I've been using for the last 25 years or so. That technique has undergone a major transformation in the quality of the data it provides, such that like crystallography, it's now able to allow us to image molecules at atomic resolution as they are in themselves. And a third technique is nuclear magnetic resonance, which also allows us in different ways to get pictures, if you like, of molecules. Those pictures are, have a very high level of accuracy and a very strong relationship to what you might call truth. So the models we get, whether it's from crystallography, cryoelectron microscopy, or nuclear magnetic resonance, are very close to telling us how the molecules are in themselves. Certainly well enough for us to be able to make very accurate predictions about how the molecule, say, might bind a substrate, something it's gonna process if it's an enzyme, and also how we might stop that molecule working. And so one of the areas of structural biology which is most interesting to the general public, certainly, is the, its capacity to guide drug design. And there are some well-known drugs out there which have been designed based on the imaging that structural biologists have made of molecules. The imaging that we do, it obviously gives us visual readouts, and those visual readouts often actually do look gorgeous to, even to the untrained eye. They have a kind of ribbon-like quality, they have form. We colour them prettily <laughs> so that we can describe maybe the different subregions or the different bits of the structures that are important. And so that means that actually if you present a member of the general public with a picture of a structure, they are likely to find it in some sense attractive because we have made it attractive. But it's also got some attractive properties anyway because it's got a certain form and a certain kind of shapeliness to it or, as I say, it can be depicted as ribbons, which an attractive, is an attractive thing in itself, a, rhythm, a ribbon pattern. But for us biologists, we can kind of delve in deeper. And so those pictures for us and those 3D pictures, 3D representations, they aren't just attractive to us in the sense of an immediate response, but also because we can look in deeply and say, oh, so that's how it works. And this is how this protein recognizes this bit of nucleic acid that it's going to bind or whatever. If I was to identify where aesthetic enjoyment comes into my structural biology, I would say it comes at many different levels. Yes, it's in the readouts, so our response to the structures we get, but it's also in our experimentation. I actually think there's a strong analogy between scientists using their clever big machines to solve structures and children playing with toys. I think the sort of games playing aspect of science I think that in the stories that we tell, there's a kind of narrative form, uh, which is in itself aesthetic. I think that when we come to make hypotheses, it's a kind of make-believe, and all these activities scientists are engaged with are actually, in an important sense, artistic. They're, in an important sense, um, aesthetic responses, joyful responses to what we see. It should be very surprising that the way in which we respond to things subjectively turns out to be a good way to understand what they're like in themselves. But scientists do find that's the case. Scientists can't stop themselves talking about how beautiful their studies are. They can't stop themselves explaining, exclaiming, this is, wow, that's beautiful. You know, I never imagined it could be so beautiful.
And I think they're kind of giving themselves away when they do that. Actually, they're revealing there's a subjective lens that they are understanding the world through, which actually reveals something objective about the world. And that should be surprising, but it also is something that's worth thinking about why that might be the case, why our, the way we feel about things, when we are glad that they exist, when we love them for what they are, the way uh, we respond when we think something's beautiful, why that gives us a sense of what they're like in themselves, tells us something about what is going on in science and what's going on in human knowledge in general.